I come here as a PhD sociology student. My advisor, one of my advisors is here, uh, Professor Rami Dabi. And my department chair, Person Simon Dean Bacheri is here. And I'd just like to thank Third World Studies and CIDS for hosting this, also OBCRD, uh, for hosting this talk. Um, as Professor Jose said, CIDS and Third World Studies were two of the centers that were covered by my study. So this is actually my way of giving back to the center, giving feedback to the center, at the same time getting feedback from the center. I'm doing this across all the nine centers that I already talked to. So um, I was given 25 to 30 minutes to give this presentation. So I'll, I'll just keep it very simple and pursue only certain angles of the of the dissertation. Uh, that's the very brief outline of what I will present. Maybe more importantly, why I study in university social research centers. As Dr. Jose mentioned, I was a research associate of the Institute of Philippine Culture at the turn of the millennium. And uh, I was there during some of the most rocky periods of IPC history, both as a research associate and someone called upon by the administration to help fix some things that were going on there. And originally, my uh, dissertation, my thesis was supposed to be about the IPC. I was supposed to give something back to them in terms of a 50th uh, anniversary offering to IPC. But my advisors, um, back then, Dr. Cynthia Bautista and Professor David, advised me not, not just to concentrate on one institute, but to expand it to several institutes. So at first, I had six institutes, and then when I went to my proposal defense, the panelists told me to bring us up to nine different centers. Okay, so uh, that's where that's where I ended up. And true enough, I discovered that what happened in IPC actually happened in a lot of the other centers in various degrees of difficulty, but more or less the trends and patterns are, are the same. So in terms of research questions, I wanted to find out you know, how the different centers evolved over time. And Dr. Porio, the chair of Ateneo Sociology, says that a lot of these centers went through periods of crisis, um, questions of legitimacy, of identity. So I wanted to find out why some of these centers were having more difficulty than other centers, why some centers were more sustainable than others. And in doing so, I was really relating all of these centers to a lot of different relationships between the centers and the universities the centers and funding agencies, and the centers and people associated with, with the centers. So while the, the study is really about the centers, it's also about the universities and how universities have evolved over time, especially in the last 20, 30 years. And also about how knowledge production has evolved over time. And so in a sense, centers are an excuse for me to understand what's going on in the broader context of universities and knowledge production. Just briefly, um, the centers I studied were as follows. It can be divided into private universities, all of them Catholic universities run by religious orders, and then four centers from the UP, including three that are based here at UP Uliman. Another big pocket is, uh, I look at six Metro Manila universities and three provincial universities. So the study involved me traveling to Cagayan de Oro, Cebu, and the methods I hear that most of the students here are in the methods course. Uh, the two key methods are the informal interviews and uh, documentary analysis. Because of that time, I can't get into uh, a full discussion of the methodology. Now, um, in terms of analytical method, um, the approach that I use is largely Comparative, I interviewed different stakeholders, as can be seen in the previous slide. Uh, I interviewed directors of centers, administrators of the university, and different funders. And really just compared what each saw with respect to these centers. And it's very interesting the points of convergence, the points of divergence between the different perspectives of the different stakeholders. And then the other, the other approach is really to compare the situation of various centers, university social research centers, to look for patterns. And there were a number of patterns that emerged across the various centers that I looked at. 
Um, the drawback here is that I couldn't do an exhaustive in institutional history. So I couldn't really go deep into each center uh, because I was looking at nine different set centers which were geographically spread apart. Okay, so that's one of the limitations in terms of the research methodology. Now, in terms of the uh, analytical method, this is sort of a central thesis statement or a framing statement. statement. The centers are framed as organizations struggling for autonomy in the midst of expectations from systems in their environment. The sensitizing framework is one from Niklas Luhmann. It was introduced to Niklas Luhmann by Professor Randi. Um, and he's a tough guy to grapple with. I have to admit, even as I read Luhmann now, he still boggles my mind sometimes. Um, and look at this simple statement that first hashtag over there, organizations are systems that reproduce decisions. Organizations in Luhmann's conceptualization are composed of nothing but decisions. Organizations are composed of nothing but decisions. That simple statement is very radical because it also means that, um, for example, the most radical implication of that is that people are outside organizations. Right? So the members of an organization do not belong to an organization. That's what it means. So Dr. Rosen, the director of Third World Study Center, does not belong to the Third World Study Center. Or the staff of the Third World Study Center do not belong to the Third World Study Center. The Third World Study Center is essentially composed of nothing but decisions made by the Third World Study Center. And my argument would be it's decisions made by the Third World Study Center in the past. Right? So that's an organization. People are outside organizations. In fact, one of the central findings of the, the study is that people are the number one cause of instability of organizations. And I think my friend from CIDS will bear me out. We were just chatting right before we were before I entered the venue. She was saying that with every director, CIDS morphs into something else. I think, in fact, for me, CIDS is the poster child of the instability of uh, centers with respect to what we call psychic systems. So, it's very radical that organizations are composed of nothing but their decisions, so people are outside the organization. But on the other hand, as I get deeper and deeper into data analysis, I begin to appreciate more and more that, uh, that insight from Nicholas Newman. The others are easier to grapple with who are who else are in the organization's environment. Third World Study Center is part of UP, but from Luhmann's conceptualization, Third World Study Center is different from UP. These are two different organizations. And for a lot of centers, that kind of differentiation in the organization and the universities that they supposedly belong to accounts for a lot of the tensions that they, that they experience. I can better explain what's going on between the centers and the universities if I think of them as two different organizations. Of course, the relationship between a university and its center creates expectations of the center that it would not have of, say, for example, social weather station of Pul or Pulse Asia because it does not belong to the university. Right? Uh, and I also look at funders, expectations that funders have of the different centers, and as we'll see later on, they've actually played a very key role in this sort of love triangle between centers, uh, funders, and universities. Now, another key conceptual point is that uh, organizational autonomy, in order for it to be tolerated, organizations must be functional for systems in their environment. Crudely <coughs> speaking, functionality is that you must solve problems of the environment. And one of my findings, one of the ways I do once my study is that, okay, you may not solve problems for the environment, but you're, you'll be tolerated so long as you don't create problems for your environment. Uh, the most problematic centers are not just those who are problematic for, uh, sorry, who are not functional for their environment, but cause problems for the systems in their environment. So you may not be important for the university, that's okay, you'll be marginalized. If you don't mind, then you're okay. But once you start creating problems for your university, then the university tends to swoop in and do, do something to you. 
So some keywords here are autonomy, functionality, expectations. Uh, not only must you be functional, you must be also you also must be more functional than possible alternatives. And one of my arguments for a lot of centers, with the possible exception of third world study center, is that the centers are becoming less and less functional for systems in their environment. And that may account for the crisis that they are facing. And I have a, a full theme on strategies of the centers and systems in their environment, especially universities. So the way I sort of push Luhmann conceptually further is that Luhmann tends to assume that, that organizations reproduce their decisions. If you read Luhmann or his uh, disciples, uh, they tend to say that organizations reproduce themselves. But what I find is that they don't necessarily reproduce themselves. Okay, so how do I reconcile Luhmann's tendency to say that organizations reproduce themselves, but in reality, don't. Um, my way out is to say that organizations, as I mentioned earlier, are about decisions, but they are decisions made in the past. And those decisions made in the past must be constantly reaffirmed. Uh, organizations are strengthened when the past decisions are reaffirmed. Organizations are weakened when past decisions are not reaffirmed. Okay. Which, which goes to sort of a typology of organizations as being strong organizations or weak organizations. One last analytical point. Um, the emphasis, I, I already finished the study and then I just sat down and reflected on everything that I had done. Then I just realized that I emphasized so much of the tension the crisis and the change. In other words, I got a drama in the centers. Um, in fact, what is one interview actually jokingly told me, I got a good one. But that's the lens that I carried with me when I when I did the study. I was, I was really looking for the points of tension, the points of crisis, and the points of, of change. Uh, but the center need not be that dramatic in its everyday life. Okay, so one of the uh, conceptual limitations of the study or the um, the lens which I used really was a lens of tension, crisis, and change. Very interesting because some of my interviews got quite emotional. Hindi naman sila galit sa akin, pero parang halos piliyak yung mga interview dito. Kasi these were things that were very close to their heart. Like the center became so much a part of them. So, so or, or they tell stories of Sigawan, they tell stories of Iyakan, threats to resign, etc. etc. And the nice thing about Luman is actually as a conceptual explanation for that. For him, emotions are associated with tightly held expectations. What is happiness? You have a tightly held expectation that something can happen, it happens, you're happy. Or what is disappointment? You have a tightly held expectation that something will happen, it didn't happen, you're disappointed, you're depressed, you're mad. See, so human actually has a way of explaining why we have emotions. Alright, so what I'll do this afternoon um, is to concentrate on tension. Uh, there are many different ways to cut the study. I sent Pang Ging already a piece on the relationship between funders and the centers. But I think for, for this afternoon's presentation, I'll cut it in terms of, of tension. What are the key sources of tension that centers face? And one of the key findings is that the one key tension for a lot of centers, particularly those in private universities, is the self-understanding of the centers and the universities were different. Some, some centers were established in teaching universities. Hindi not teaching universities. Eh? Some centers were established in formation universities. Okay? Formation universities. Uh, okay, for example, we're celebrating the 40th year of Persons for Others. Okay, so Pedro Arupe gave a speech 40 years ago and said, you must go out there and become men for others. It's a lot of women on the Jesuit schools. Okay, so, that's the tradition. Okay, that Ateneo is all about formation. And up to today, it's very, still very, very strong. I mean, there's already a turn to research, but the angle of formation is still very strong. Or say, for example, in USD, uh, the Catholic formation. The big debate in USD and Ateneo about the, the RH bill. So, 
Mary Roselli is reacting to the entire situation. Mary Roselli is a patrimonial also you said that the priests seem to think that you don't need good research to form good persons. So these centers were formed in universities which were primarily teaching universities. So they were marginal. And they were really, all of these centers, uh, ITC, SRC, um, and Rinku were, were really marginal to the life of their university. At one point, for example, IPC was, they were saying that IPC was more famous abroad than Ateneo. Because IPC was producing all sorts of research and Ateneo was not. They didn't even know that IPC was part of Ateneo. Uh, but within Ateneo, IPC was marginal. Uh, Ateneo students themselves did not even know that IPC existed. And the people at IPC, yung kinalakit nila, they were not recognized for the good work that they were doing within Ateneo. Right? I presented something like this at IPC, and then one of the old-time research associates raised her hand, her hand and said, so you mean to tell me all this time Ateneo did not prioritize research? I said, yes. And that's why you were on the margins of, um, of Ateneo. And it's not just coming from here, the associates. It was also coming from the administrators. And one administrator told me quite frankly that IPC was marginal to the university. It was marginal, it was marginal. Double <laughs> okay. um, And what did this marginality mean? That you were not recognized for the work that you did? It wasn't clear whether or not you were an employee of the university. Did you belong to the university or didn't you belong to the university? It was not clear. And then, for a lot of the centers, they were not even funded by the university. They had to pay for their own, they had to pay for their own key. So, that, that's, and, and the reason why this happened was because the universities were really not into research. A lot of these private universities got into research only in the last 20 years because of all of these rankings and chat. Okay, but before that, research was really not a, a priority. So, so you might ask, why were they established in the first place? I mean, if they were so marginal to, the, to their universities, why were they established in the first place? Uh, different stories for Rinpo and Saber University, they were established so that the educational institution could become a university. Because in order for you to be, to be a university, you have to show proof of research competency. So what happened was that in 1958, Rinko was established. In 1959, Xavier University became a university. Same thing actually for the SAT. The social, um, I forget now what the name of the unit was. It's not SDRC. But they formed the research center, University Research Center, Yata. And then the year after, they got their university status in 1972. So that's one reason. But the problem with Rinko was that once the university once it solved a problem for the university, um, there really wasn't any more use for them anymore because the university already solved the problem and then Rinku was pretty much left alone by the Xavier University. Uh, OPS, Office of Population Studies in the University of San Carlos, their story is similar to UPTI here. They were formed, my theory is that they were formed because of external forceps, for foundation especially. Uh, for a foundation approach, you can ask any form a center that will do demography and population studies. Here's the funding, we'll fund all of your people so that they can study abroad. Uh, and you said yes, why okay, would you say, say no to, to something like that? Alright, um, but the problem is that since it's not internally, the demand is not internally generated, uh, in the sense both UPPI and OPS, again, were marginal to their university. In fact, UPPI's big drama was when they were forced. They used to be a standalone institute, and then they were incorporated into CSSP in 1981, uh, kicking and screaming. <laughs> they, they were they were put here. Okay. Um, and then the last one is IPC, uh, Ateneo. What's their story? You know, I was able to get letters between Jesuits, uh, number of letters between Jesuits about the establishment of IPC. It was very clear to me from the letters that the university did not want an IPC. They did not want IPC to be formed. But IPC was formed because of the um, strong-willed nature of uh, one of the founders, 
at the same time, they had the support of the provincial. Right? So they both ram IEPC down the throats of the university. True enough, four years into its existence, the university president wanted IPC scrap and, and review. So, you know, a lot of the tensions were already there. I, I think I wasn't ready for an IPC, but it was forced uh, onto them. So, so in a sense, um, if you're a teaching university and then you have these research institutes, if you were to put it in terms of the conceptual framework, you can say that the research institutes did not reproduce the, the university. The research institutes did not reinforce the identity of the university as a teaching or formation university. And therefore, they were, they were marginalized. The expectations with respect to... Um, the expectations with respect to what they were and what they should have been from the eyes of the university were incongruent. And that's why they became very problematic. In the last 20 years, 10 to 20 years, um, universities, universally, it's not just the private universities, increasingly turn to research. You see here in UP, you see Ateneo and all the other universities, even the provincial universities like Xavier, USC, etc. They put in research offices. Believe it or not, some universities just put in research offices in the last 10 years. Right? That's how unimportant research has been for uh, some universities. Now, you would think that if the problem before was that you had research institutes in non-research universities, that once the universities turn to research, the centers would play a more prominent role. But what happened was that the universities turned to a particular kind of research that the centers were not doing. In particular, the universities, because of all of these global rankings, uh, turn to publication in scholarly journals. So the question is always, are you ISI or are you Scopus? Okay, I'm lagging, lagging yung, uh, But the problem was that the centers were not publishing in that form. They were not publishing in ISI or Scopus publications. So from the university's point of view, they were in a sense still marginal. They were still not producing publications which can be considered useful to solve the problems of the university. Notable exceptions here are UPPI. UPPI publishes a lot in uh, demographic population studies journals, and it has its own journal, which is Focus of the Philippine Population Journal, and Third World Study Center, which has the world, the world famous Casarinda. Okay, so, so these two institutes have played it well in the sense that their output is aligned with university expectations. The other centers are not producing the kinds of outputs that their universities will find valuable. A very interesting note, in the last administration under President Roman, what has happened is that as UP turned more and more towards research and the OBPAA and the OBCRD started giving more and more grants of substantial amounts to 1,000, 500,000, etc. CIDS role of giving grants to faculty became less and less important. In fact, at one point, uh, the administration of EP, sorry, President Truman said that CIDS is duplicating the functions of OBCRD and OBPA, therefore CIDS has to be restructured radically and do something, do something else. See, so this is what we mean by functional alternative. Functional alternatives emerge to CIDS. And these functional alternatives are actually within the university, OBCRD and OBEA. Okay, so in those two instances, you see incongruence between the university's problems that they're trying to solve and the role of the research center. And that's why a lot of research centers were marginalized and problematic because they did not help solve the problems of the universities. All right. Um, the second source of tension is in terms of funding effects. The different centers were funded differently. The ones who were worse off were the ones in private universities, except for La Salle, and now USD. But the others, Ateneo, Ateneo, USC, and Xavier University, were really badly off because they were expected to earn their own team. At one point, Ateneo was paying 35% overhead. 
right now it's still paying 600,000 a year for rental. It's renting from its own uh, university. It's paying for electricity, utilities, etc. So yung mga private universities na nagang kawawa, yung mga centers. Uh, at least here in the state system, and in Lasalle, and now UST, the universities don't charge for uh, all of these rental. They even pay for the loading of the uh, center personnel. Doon sa IPC, for example, OT mong director's time has to be paid for by the director. So the director has to raise enough money to pay for her own uh, salary. Now, so you have that wide range of financial support. Except that, in no instance, was the research operations supported by the university until very recently. So you're paid for your MOE, utilities, etc. But the, the university, until very recently, did not give you money to actually do research. You had to... So what happened was that, People were forced to turn to external funders to fund their research, but these external funders had their own expectations of the centers. First, in terms of the nature of research, the funders want policy-oriented research. The, the, the funders want applied research rather than theoretical research. So these centers were not producing theoretical research, with the exception of third world study center. Okay, I'm third, actually, of all the centers, I studied third world. We also need to <laughs> so, Third world is the most aligned with their, with their university. Because from the very start, it's not the orientation. It's the alignment siya dun sa, uh, university. But all the other centers were producing policy-oriented research. And the universities did not find this policy-oriented research valuable. Okay, it wasn't a valuable kind of research. It was valuable for the funders, but not valuable for the university. Um, one of my insights here is that it's sort of, with, with the universities, turning to more academic research para nag functionally differentiate ang research towards the funders, government, etc. And then academic research oriented towards prof what Uroi calls professional sociology okay, or professional academic discourse. That professional academic discourse is useless for the policy makers. And I've interviewed policy makers who say it outright, it's useless. Okay? Um, on the other hand, the uh, policy research is useless in terms of academia. Now, there are also differences in the research agenda. And who dictates the agenda? The funder. Okay? It's the funder who dictates the agenda. And that agenda may not necessarily, or usually is not aligned with the university agenda. In Catholic schools, one of the central tensions is research on family planning, contraceptives. Right? So, it is Cathy had a research associate kung paano niyo gagawin yung study na yun uh, within a Catholic university. Right? And, and the administrators say, why don't we have a say in the research agenda of our own center? This will now become a problem of accountability. The center is not accountable to the university. Recent developments have made things worse for the center. uh, centers. First, emergence of functional alternatives. It used to be that the centers, like IPC, had no competition. No competition. They were, it was a seller's market. They could demand from the founder that I will be able to do for you, but I'm not going to be able to Now, faculty can very well just get money outside without going through a center. That way you have to go through a center. Now you don't have to. So what's the functionality of a center for the faculty? Okay. Um, so that's one of the big question marks. And then there are other developments like embargoes. You make the paper, but it's in the name of the funder. Or you make the paper and you cannot publish it. Secret. You do a study on conditional cash transfers, but you can never ever talk about it. Okay. Uh, Short-term contracts. One center got funding for 10 years, another one got 5 years, 2 years. Now we're talking about contracts of 4 weeks. Funder comes tells me, I have given you 4 weeks to do this study. 
uh, how can you do theoretical research in four weeks? And then template-based research. Here's my survey, collect the data. Give me the raw data, take care of analysis. So you're a numerator, <laughs> you're the one going out there and you're uh, just simply collecting the data. That's the trend now in terms of knowledge production. So the centers now are pulled in that direction. And yet at the same time, the universities are becoming more and more theoretical in their orientation. In the sense, the centers are being pulled apart. The last dimension is operational. I've already discussed differences in employee status. One of my findings here is that all centers, university again, across all the universities, all faculty associates are expected to be full-time faculty. What three centers did was that they pulled out of being full-time faculty status, made themselves full-time researchers, and that's when they started having problems with their, their universities. All universities expect faculty associates to be full-time faculty. And yet at the same time, okay, and then one of the problems is if you're a full-time associate doing only research, then you're really not a member of the, the university. You're denied clinic benefits, you're denied uh, you can't park here. <laughs> so, so imagine, gano ka sa mga loob ng mga ibang center employees. And yet, when PAAS to comes along accreditation for private schools, they're the only ones doing research. So now, the universities will find a way to make them look like they are part of the university. So lalo sa mga loob ng mga private university center employees, kasi <coughs> Pag walang pa-ASCO, ayaw niya kami. Pag nandiyan yung pa-ASCO, bigla we belong to the university. Pag wala na naman yung pa-ASCO, out na naman. <laughs> so parang yun nila nagagamit lang siya. Alright. Third dimension, accounting and accountability. Um, all the centers need their accounting. With, with the exception of LASAL, the Social Development Research Center. All of, their, all of the university centers dislike finding dysfunctional their accounting systems. So all of them, at one point or another, started working with foundations. But the problem with the foundations is that uh, they're less accountable to the university. So now the university's complaint is that you have all of these centers with no sense of accountability to the university. Right? So on the one hand, you have a dysfunctional bureaucracy. On the other hand, you have an uh, unaccountable uh, center. Right? Uh, next, but I'll just end with this slide. No? Vulnerability to shifts in scientific systems. It is as I was as a CIDS. Um, some centers, the source of instability really were the people associated with the center. Um, I think of all the centers that I studied, CIDS really had it bad. Not so much because of the center director, but more because of the university president. Right? Uh, Established by Angara in 1987, and Angara was the one who came up with the idea of a, of a CIDS. And then President Abueva came along, and he didn't seem to, I don't know, I never got to talk to him, he refused to uh, answer my calls. <laughs> so so he, he didn't pay much attention to CIDS, right? So it sort of lay low. And then uh, President Aguirre came along, and he was really gung-ho about uh, CIPS being involved in it. And then President Pimenso came along and then he put it under uh, Dr. Jokno, OBP AA. So he said, told me, I didn't have time for it anymore. So he put it under uh, OBP AA. And then President Roman came along and then she really radically restructured the, um, the CIPS. Like I was asking Mom earlier, what has happened ever since? Because I'm curious with the new president, President Pascual. You see, ideas has shifted again. See, ideas has been the, the, my poster child for vulnerability sh shifts in psychic systems. Every time the university president changes, see, ideas changes. How can you expect to live under such an environment where your expectations are unstable? It's very difficult for, for a center to thrive under such conditions. Um, I'll skip the last two slides in the interest of time. Maybe just one last point here related to CIDS also. When are you more autonomous? You're more autonomous when you have financial autonomy. When you can earn your own money and you're not dependent on the university. The centers which had less financial autonomy tended to be what's called hypostatized. In other words, the university replaced its logic for the logic of the center. 
it's sort of killing killing the organization. If organizations are defined as past decisions. When the university comes in and swoops in and decides for the center, you effectively kill the center. And I've seen this in a lot of uh, instances across the centers where the universities hypostatize their their centers. And one of the key variables here is the lack of financial autonomy. Um, Turtle studies thrives because it can do uh, and it can it can live without the university. It, the university supports, but in terms of research operations, it can manage. The other centers which got into trouble got into trouble at their weakest financial point when they had to turn to the university to ask for assistance. That's when the university swooped in and changed uh, the nature of the center. So, just to summarize, tensions and crises can be accounted for by the incongruence of expectations between universities, funders, centers, and even the people associated with the, with the centers. And the inability of the centers to respond to changes in the environment. For example, the inability of a lot of centers to change along with their universities in the world of world university rankings. And uh, evolution can be adjusted, uh, accounted for by centers adjusting themselves to meet new expectations. But more often than not, uh, changes in centers can be accounted for by hypostatization, like especially when the universities make decisions for the centers and in effect kill the past of the, of the center. All right, so thank you very much. We'll just take questions. Later.